Let me say good evening to each of you and one of the 2021 Holmes Ingram's lectures. I am Christopher, I serve as Associate Dean of Doctoral Studies here at Memphis Theological Seminary. And I, along with Dr. Pete Gecki and Dr. Tricia Vesley, we serve on the Community Engagement Committee, the committee that's responsible for tonight's lectures. Again, given the um, the recent weather challenges that we have had literally all over the country, we are glad that you were able to log in and be with us on tonight. So again, I want to say to students, to faculty, staff, alumni, and friends of Memphis Theological Seminary, welcome to the 2021 Holmes Ingram Lectures. Let's pray together. Oh Lord, our God, how excellent is your name in all the earth. God, again, we are grateful to be able to gather together, even though we are socially distant, we are grateful that we are yet spiritually connected. We are in awe, oh God, of how we are able to operate at the intersections of technology and theology. Thank you that in spite of the weather challenges, dear God, that people were still able to log on tonight benefit from what we believe is going to be both a fruitful and faithful discussion and dialogue. So again, God, we invoke your presence on tonight and we pray, oh God, that uh, your people would be blessed in a real way by what will be shared on tonight. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Tonight's lectures, you all, are named in honor of Dr. Barbara Holmes and Dr. William T. Ingram. Dr. Barbara Barbara Holmes is former Dean in the Academic Affairs here at Memphis Theological Seminary. At the time of her appointment, she was the only African-American woman in the country to serve in that particular post. Dr. William T. Ingram served as both a professor and Dean of Cumberland Presbyterian Seminary in McKenzie, Tennessee. However, when the seminary relocated from McKenzie to Memphis, he became the first president of Memphis Theological Seminary. As again, tonight's lectures are named in honor of Dr. Barbara Holmes and Dr. William T. Ingram. We are certainly excited about our guest lecturer on tonight. Dr. Lisa Thompson is a native of Cedar Grove, North Carolina. She serves as associate professor and the Cornelius Vanderbilt Chancellor Faculty Fellow of Black Homiletics and Liturgics at the Divinity School and Graduate Department of Religion of Vanderbilt University. As a leader in scholarship that values intellectual rigor and concerns of faith, she holds a Doctor of Philosophy and a Master of Arts in Religion from Vanderbilt University. She prioritizes discussing the ways religion can use for the deconstruction or uplift of our life together. Her current book projects are entitled Ingenuity, Preaching as the Outsider, and Preaching the Headlines. Prior to joining Vanderbilt Divinity School, she held posts as Assistant Professor of Homiletics at Union Theological Seminary in the city of New York, Assistant Professor of Homiletics at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and Lilly Faculty Fellow at McCormick Theological Seminary in Chicago, Illinois. Dr. Thompson has served as President of the Black Caucus of the Academy of Homiletics and served on the advisory board of Wabash Center for Teaching Religion and Theology and is a nominating member of the Association of Practical Theology. Through her teaching, service, and scholarship, Dr. Thompson prioritizes concrete outcomes as a reflection of the traditions and values we claim to believe. So again, it is my honor and my distinct pleasure to introduce and want to mythological virtually, Dr. Lisa Thompson. Dr. Davis, uh, thank you. Is audio okay? Great. Uh, well, thank you, Dr. Davis. That is one of the most extensive introductions I've received and thank you you for being a great colleague and friend um, and one who's willing to create space. Many thanks to the President Board of Trustees there at Memphis Theological Seminary and the great work and legacy that we're honoring here it, with Holmes and Ingram Lectures. So, so I am certain that without especially the trailblazer of Dr. Barbara Holmes, I would not be here thinking around this work or doing this work uh, as many Black feminists and Black womanists would be, as she was a trailblazer and interrupter in the Theological Academy and extension to their mentor. So for the time we have this evening, Dr. Uh, the Tom, subject of, yes. If I could just interrupt you very briefly for the last time, 
I do want to say to all of the attendees that feel free to post your questions throughout. And at the end of the lecture, we will do our best to cover as many of those as we can in the time that's allotted. But please post those throughout the lecture. Dr. Tom. Absolutely. Thank you. Yes, please post them and also post what does and what doesn't make sense to you and how I am or am not making sense. This is an invitation to think aloud with me this evening. So for our topic this evening, I've entitled this lecture from interlopers to interrupters, black preaching, black life and black flesh. Uh, so the world around us has shown us the hazards of living seeing. while black. This the stratification and of human life by means of regulating its value um, in terms of in terms of one rung above or below another is what we live through. It's the practice that leads to ongoing hazard li ha hazardous living conditions for Black folk. In a similar way, that same stratification is what the pursuit of Black beauty black joy and black life blatantly defies. For this evening, what became most important or becomes most important is the ways in which we absorb those same stratifications into our black religious spaces, right? So what keeps black flesh living in danger inside and outside of our worship spaces? We have deemed some people, some fleshy experiences as interloper or outsider. When we hear the cries of Black Lives Matter, consider the movement or call the resistant multi-religious practices of Black flesh under the institution of slaveocracy, these are cries that contest being assigned interloper or outsider by others. An inter Interloper is someone who engages a space or situation where they are not wanted or are considered to not belong. The interloper is the one who is to watch and receive what others dictate the world and their lives should be. For Black flesh, that place of belonging is any given place in society, whether that be home, the streets, or houses of worship. We live with the dynamics of power playing out in our midst and laying marks on our bodies every single day. Toni Morrison in her The Origins of Others delineates how the category of other has been used in history and in particularly in the literary arts. She argues that other as a category and othering as a practice are means of estrangement for one's own empowerment. It is a move that aligns with power for the sake of solidifying belonging. It, and is rarely used in benign terms or for the sake of identifying distinctives and characteristics and identity. The question to preaching and to those of us belonging to communities of faith, particularly black communities of faith, is what then does this mean for our work? Let me say a word here about flesh and why it is a part of our conversations about preaching and our practices of striving existence. One of the gifts of Black preaching traditions and Black traditions is the acknowledgement of everyday life, not as a secondary aspect of faith, but as a primary aspect of faith. Faith is assumed to be a part of everyday life, Faith takes shape around, within, and is infused with the joys, hopes, and struggles of everyday life. The traditions construct being a person of faith as one believing in the context of a community's very present realities. The language of faith and preaching are shaped in the language of the people, of the, in the language people know. The symbols, imagery, and illustrative material is curated from the stuff of life. The stuff of life shapes the stuff of preaching and faith. In other words, the ordinariness of life and our experiences of living and trying to navigate the world around us are squarely connected to what it means to be human, spirit-filled flesh. And Black preaching traditions have acknowledged this reality from their inception. So we know the world based on the vantage point from which we experience it. 
we navigate the world in our bodies, collecting and sharing experiences along the way. We sort and sift these experiences, information and emotions through flesh. Fleshy parts of life pertain to all it means to be. They pertain to our skin and its hues, our mental and physical abilities, and who we do or do not have sexual and non-sexual partnerships with. Flesh. They also extend to our perceived vitality or wisdom due to age, the treatment and characteristics we assign based on gender, how we associate value and worth with how much a body weighs or how much space it takes up, and a host of other things. Every day we experience the burdens and joys of being living or spirit-filled flesh. Matters of the flesh and their impact on our interactions are connected to people's ability or inability to flourish here and now. Because flesh and its worth is always subject to interpretation in the presence of power. The, dem the demise of human life is a viable option if we do not consciously engage matters of the flesh and preaching and attend to the value and worth of all black flesh, not, a politically, not as a politically correct agenda, but instead as a theological endeavor that is political at its core. And Sean Copeland, womanist theologian, reminds us that black embodied being in the world is connected to the struggle to achieve and exercise freedom in history and society. Society. In flesh freedom, we as spirit filled flesh, being free to live, move, achieve without constraint, is itself a site of divine revelation. Discipleship is embodied praxis, and the evidence of its realized or our faithfulness to the thing of faith is made evidence, evident through the ability of bodies to literally be free without the looming threat of premature death or, or erasure. I will say it this way. A core of Christian faith traditions is the profession. God came in the flesh so that we might have life and have it more abundantly. What we are called to contend with are the ways in which the core of the gospel claim is not figuratively being free to life. It is being free to live free to life period it is the freedom to live that interruptures of hate violation and oppression which are no less than sin and these structures violence and oppression hand out sentences of deterioration and death on life how our bodies are interpreted by society and faith traditions greatly impact the ongoingness of our lived realities. This includes what we should and should not do, where we do and do not belong, and who exactly gets to say so. Matters of the flesh and their impact on our interactions are connected to people's ability or inability to flourish here and now without question. The choices we make in attending to matters of the flesh impacts physical livelihoods, what we do in preaching, how we do and do not attend to what it means to live in this world as a spirit-filled being that is covered in flesh absolutely impacts folks' physical livelihood. We have help from Black faith and Black preaching traditions in attending to the connections between flesh and life. Ethicist Amy Still, and reflecting on Barbara Holmes' work, Unspeakable Joy says that Holmes calls us to remember that Black gospel was born in the complex realities of Black life and Black death. As Holmes gives us the cautionary note that Black religion is not a jukebox phenomenon, nor the background music of capitalism. In this, the meaning of the gospel is lost when it is snatched from its context. Black lived realities, Black flesh. A tradition that privileges our knowing of the triumphs, trials, and tragedies of what it means to be human in this world is fleshy at its core. Black preaching traditions are fleshy at their core. Now the hiccup 
in these traditions is the same as those in our world and that hiccup would be power. The past and future of black preaching must contend with its stratification of black flesh, whose experiences matter at the table and how those experiences impact the ways texts are interpreted, the ways we make faith claims and how we make those claims. Ironically, it is the very tradition of black preaching that will do the work of transforming black preaching. So now just to say a word here about interlopers and interrupters and the difference between those who are sitting at the table. The interloper engages even as other folk would rather not be bothered with them. And yet being an interloper is not the same thing as being one who fully participates in a conversation. Fully participating means our ideas, lives, and priorities are factors considered and attended to in earnest at the table. And here comes the rub we feel. When the interloper does not ask, but assumes their place as a conversation partner. As we have moved along, not considering the spectrum of black lived realities in the world, when those fleshy experiences show up at the table as full participants, they become disruptive to the status quo. They interrupt or obstruct our long held practices, beliefs and traditions. If we dare engage these experiences as full participants in shaping our conversations about life with each other and life with God. So here enters the longstanding preaching practices of black women, whether they were or were never recognized in the broader story we tell about black preaching and in our ongoing perception of what black, pre black preaching is. Many folk now, I know this week, because I've seen your Facebook feeds and your uh, Twitter threads, have watched the PBS study, PBS show, I'm sorry, documentary on black church, right? So, and as I watched this special, I sat there and I was confident that many people, lay folk and clergy, were hearing names for the first time. I was confident that many people had no idea there was a Prathier Hall or a Nanny Helen Burroughs or a Jarena Lee, let alone our contemporary Black preaching women. The realities of Black preaching ministries, the obstacles they face and their literal erasure from black preaching histories is one of the most poignant claims of evidence of the ongoing stratification of black flesh within black preaching traditions. And here is what it looks like still in 2021. The preacher, even as she occupies her particular body and uses words within a particular space, is constantly in tension with received traditions of how a sermon takes shape and is performed and the look of the bodies that carry out its performance. The process of listening and understanding are also shaped by the tradition and attended to preaching assumes in earnest that those in a community give you authority to name and struck truth with them. The act assumes a place at the table and the validity of the voice. Tradition, the generally contested role of women in society and religion, and listener expectations continue to shape how women are and are not perceived as legitimate proclaimers. Although women have been preaching throughout time, points of friction remain around the presence of their bodies and acts of proclamation. Women who proclaim are often faced with conditions that mirror pioneering or the breaking of new ground. There are numerous old roots and thorns to work through. Even when these tensions are not overt, we remain subliminal and rubble beneath. The limited confines we place on envisioning, preaching, and the legitimate proclaimer harkens back to a world where media, political machines, and economic structures still call into question Black women's capabilities to name and define reality at the table. This is the same world that creeps in and allows us to question a preacher's femininity, 
or masculinity and ability to construct meaningful words. Sounding like a woman has just as much to do with perception of one's ability to reason as it does with vocal pitch and intonation. And sounding like a man is seated in the perception of authority being the antithesis of femininity as a Victorian ideal cast shadows on black womanhood. Right, so we say sometimes black women preachers, oh, she sounds like a woman, I don't like her preaching. Or, oh, she sounds like a man, I don't like her preaching. Like you, you damned if you do and if you don't, right? Uh, so, and so in thinking about this, if a preacher strays too far to the left or right of a listener's center, then she has not preached the mythical sermon or black sermon at all. Black women continue to preach effectively, even as they exist within the constant tension of pioneering and faux pioneering. The point of Marvel, Marvel without offense, should be choreography of this complex daily, even as they how these proclaimers negotiate external expectations and demands while inventing and performing the sermon is something which a spectrum of individuals can learn, right? This is something that impacts preaching literature and understanding and practices writ large. We are constantly attempting to mediate expectations and retain some form of authenticity in preaching while helping listeners connect with what is said. This dynamic requires the preacher, especially the outsider, to deploy creativity know how while navigating potential obstacles to her message, including how she is or is not perceived as a preacher. We are constantly attempting to do this work and in the best generatively disruptive practices, black preaching women are naming the conditions and terms on which they will move about in the world and pulpit spaces as unequivocally black woman and fully human. First and foremost, those we have most excluded from the conversation by deeming them as other or outsider must set the terms for our, our preaching rules of engagement. They get to set the rules. This includes black women and beyond. If we do not privilege the lives and truth of the most vulnerable in our communities, then we cannot be faithful to the most fundamental work of preaching itself. That work being opening up possibilities of the gospel enfleshed as lived freedom. Just as a bridge or road sign points in a particular direction, the ongoing work of preaching as it occurs within a community leads us along a path indicating what preaching should entail. This historical path consists of roadsides that point in a particular direction in terms of what is fitting or even good preaching. These blueprints are formulated against the backdrop of preaching, both it takes place at a very particular moment in a very particular community and as it occurred over time. For instance, Mary Magdalene, via the sermon that names Jesus' resurrection is not disconnected from the preacher of Prentia Hall, Malcolm X, Nanny Helen Burroughs, Otis Moss Jr., Carolyn Ann McKnight, Gene Stewart, Vashon McKenzie, and the many unnamed. Every one of these proclaimers in their various iterations of preaching is connected to a tradition across time and space. There is a wide tradition of preaching that intersects with the practices of preaching at any given moment. Therefore, as preaching has the ability to take on new flesh within the community, every preacher and community stands in conversation and oftentimes in tension with the tradition beyond herself and the community. The tension between this tethering of history and the not yet existent in imagining is what makes for the possibilities and limits of preaching, especially for those who preach as outsiders or interlopers. The effective preacher finds ways to be in conversation with and utilize assumptions about preaching while overlaying her own intonation, pitch, and coloring to the task. The one proclaims effectively, uses the road signs as just that, a road sign. 
as she engages her own wisdom and creativity and imagines for the sake of the community. Indeed, is the beautiful balancing act and skillful pursuit of every preacher. She makes use of the tradition for the sake of the community for which she speaks, but also for the community's hopes about what preacher re preaching renders possible. Namely, preaching renders possible a not yet existent, though somewhat known, encounter with the sacred. The hope in preaching is the possibility of being interlopers on sacred utterances, which only emerge because God chooses to self-reveal in the tradition. And yet we must contend with our fleshy experiences in its limitations and possibilities for discerning these moments of sacred inbreaking. So I'll say a bit more here about preaching as a communally defined practice. Our understanding of preaching is derived in community and by community. This is how we wrestle with those fleshy limitations and possibilities. The collective defines what is and what is not a valid expression of preaching in its midst and sets boundaries on preaching based on inherited and often reproduced experience of preaching. The oral tradition of call and response in some black preaching traditions offers us a glimpse of a community setting the boundaries and limits of preaching, right? So in the preaching moment, a listener may verbally offer the following response, that's preaching, preach. If y'all were off mute and with me, you may say that's preaching, preach. Yeah, that's good at the time. These call outs of affirmation not only urge the preacher to forge ahead, in her immediate practice of preaching, but also somehow act as an indicator of what preaching should be, how it should function, and its shape within the community. Similarly, be careful, help him, Lord, or the eerie presence of silence, where one would hope for an audible response, might be that of another boundary and limit as a listener expresses that the right fitting and desired scaffolding is absent. Maybe even the right body is absent. In this instance, the community withdraws its validation from what is right preaching or good preaching. In other words, that's not preaching at all. As the community sets the parameters of preaching in its midst by some past experiences, it also intentionally or unknowingly defines the future or continual practice of preaching in its midst. The body is far from incidental in the process of making a discrete moment of preaching valid. Who shows up is not incidental to this yes or amen. Preaching is carried out by flesh and it lands upon flesh. Therefore, we cannot discard the body as a vehicle, nor is influence in carrying forth the memory of preaching in a community. The boundaries and expectations of preaching within the community are very much dictated, formed and understood by the way preaching is carried forth to the body and how preaching encounters the body. When we limit preaching, to the embodiment of its practice, as opposed to the hope for a thing preaching makes way for, namely proclamation or sacred inbreaking or revelation, the body no longer becomes a medium for preaching. Instead, the body is perceived as a limitation to preaching, as a limitation of what one can do or what preaching is. This perception of the body as limitation is acutely true when particular individuals are valued more or less because of the bodies they habit, inhabit, how their flesh shows up. For instance, women are often told good speech as opposed to good sermon. Differently abled individuals may not be readily visual, visualized as preachers. Here, the presence of a body is only valued based on what it can and cannot produce. Namely, does one preach like those other bodies over there? If the answer is yes, then that's preaching. If their answer is no, then that might not be preaching. In these scenarios, it is no longer the rationale or ethic of preaching that drives its practice, the ability to mimic or imitate 
the history of preaching as the community knows it or has experienced it drives the practice forward. And here is where we potentially close off preaching and the possibilities of sacred inbreaking through the very continual and ongoing practice of preaching itself. Yet some determine ways to work with the expectations of preaching for their own purposes. We are conditioned to perceive what good preaching is or is not, and Black women with the spectrum, along with the spectrum of Black flesh, interrupt that conditioning for the better. Black and male are the immediate images and meters that measure the rhetorical performance and the Black sermon, even if merely at the subconscious level. The legitimate practices and function of the preacher within the context of Black religious life have influenced images of the Black preacher, as well as the descriptive and prescriptive characters, caricatures, judgments, and assumptions of his skeptics and genuine critics or supporters. Images of the Black preacher have negative and positive characteristics based on a skewed history, racist stereotypes, and the actions of preachers themselves. And over time, the images have converged into one predominant image that is unequivocally Black and male. Beyond pulpits and pews, we encounter real and imagined constructions of this preacher in the bodies and narratives of actual preachers in American literature, as well as in the contemporary media and artistic expressions. The embodiment of maleness and masculinity has rendered control over pulpit spaces. Roxanne Mumford notes that when women are characterized as preachers in American literature, they most often appear preaching outside of pulpit spaces. The characterization is also found right in the middle of Black women's literature as a kind of snapshot in history. A black woman preacher prototype appears in Zora Neale Hurston's Their Eyes Are Watching God. The reader is only introduced to her as Nanny. She is the grandmother of the protagonist, Janie Crawford. Nanny overtly says, I wanted to preach a great sermon about colored women sitting on high, but there wasn't no pulpit for me. Through Nanny's words, Hurston sheds light on both the male-oriented pulpit and the place of Black women in society. While the pulpit has eluded Nanny and her sermon about the life, strength, and God of Black women, a uh, kind of contrast is Baby Suggs Holy in Toni Morrison's Beloved, who creates a pulpit where one does not exist the classic itinerant preacher. Baby Sugg's platform is a, often a huge flat rock. And from this pulpit, she invites the women to cry, the men to dance, and the children to laugh. She denounces the, the divide between the bodily and spiritual for the sake of proclamation that attends to the life of her community. For Baby Suggs is the classic Black woman itinerant who takes the audience where her spirit and with whomever her heart is open, whomever's heart is open, be it at the kitchen table, a preaching or wide open meadow. In these kinds of depictions of preaching, the male's control as orator and author a sanctioned pulpit speech is exemplified. However, the lives and strength of black women are not lost on these pulpitless proclaimers but they are the substance of their sermons, right? The lived wisdom of Black women reshapes the work of these pulpitless preaching women. We witness the ongoing phenomena of who the Black preacher is perceived to be as they are regularly cast as Black and male television, film, and theater, be that serious dramas or comedic satires. So thinking about the role of the community and the preaching practice as it has been experienced defining ongoing preaching practices, I want to say a word here about imitating and mimicking. So preaching is often learned through imitation and mimicking. It's not necessarily a bad thing, right? This is kind of uh, individual preachers often imitate or mimic those with whom they find resonance in preaching. 
preaching preachers find their way into their preaching voice as they imitate other preachers, those who they, they admire in their tradition or whom they personally favor. This process of finding voice through others is a natural process of the journey of the preacher. However, there are limits to imitation and mimicking. This is particularly true for those who are minoritized or othered or considered interlopers in the work of preaching, such as women. And they often perform outside of a community's preacher's prototype. Creating one's preaching voice and towards authenticity are difficult when models that may have affinity with your evolving voice and are not present. However, when the standard within the community's expectation of preaching stops at the replication of a particular government has style it for working families, as opposed to living I know what it's into like. Ooh, preaching exponential iterations, mimicking and imitation become mechanisms that contribute to closing preaching off from its purposes. And in turn, mimicking and imitation close the community off from the possibilities and hopes of preaching in its midst. There is an inherent difference between mimicking and imitating preaching styles to their ultimate ends and creatively riffing off of and making use of existent tradition and style as one finds their own voice. So the final word I will say here is about choreography and interruptions in practice, right? As Black women navigate this dance in Black preaching traditions. When a preacher creatively makes use of tradition, they engage such tactics for the purposes of gaining a listening while overcoming in the reception of their message. Obstacles may range from you don't look or sound like a preacher to resistance to the proposal of an alternative faith narrative that potentially shifts communal outlooks on faith in the world. Preaching is a creative process that exists within the playing fields of tradition. And ingenuity makes use of those playing fields, not just for the sake of preaching, but also for what preaching makes possible. Christian preaching traditions await and anticipate sacred vibrations breaking into our midst. However, a complex dance occurs between the hopes of offering up an amen, a tradition we perceive to have made the amen possible, and the bodies that are not allowed to move in and out of pulpit spaces. The parties of the dance are often reduced to the mechanics of rigid choreography, as opposed to allowing the music to set the rhythm or the of the choreography to inspire the dance. The result is choreography or preaching out of sync with the music of its inspiration, proclamation and revelation. Inspiration is traded for one's confidence in rigid movement, which is unimaginative practice that does not fit every literal body attempting its sequence, the outsider. As a result, bodies are hurled in and out of that spiral of rigidity. We ignore to the demise of many the ability of trusted choreography joining inspiration for the same creative dance that makes space for every single body. In spite of the threats of rigidity, there are moments when unexpected things happen. People make use of choreography with the play on its past while pushing its present, and somehow inspiration breaks through. There is an appearance, and in this appearance, we are reminded of the authentic hopes of the dance once again. Our hope in preaching is not replicating fixed patterns. Instead, our hope is to exchange fixed patterns for that which makes space for vibrant possibilities of sacred inbreaking in our midst as it echoes backwards and forward to sacredly fleshly encounters we have known. As we make room for these reverberations, we make room for Black preaching to align with its greatest hopes, namely hope that we move closer to proximity to that which is most holy and most true. And that movement includes what sets all free.
not some of us, but what sets all of us free. This holy truth is only clarified as it is named and recognized as such by the entire community, the entire spectrum of black flesh. While everybody contributes to ranging a choreography that responds to inspiration. Interruption is an aspect of women's preaching traditions. When you marry Kim traces the theology and practice of women preachers from the early church through the 20th century and discusses how particulars of feminine experiences influence the content and theology of preaching. I would say women's experiences. These rhetorical strategies and the rhetorical strategies and physical presence of black women in pulpit space is significant because they interject distinct experiences and imagery into otherwise masculine and patriarchal contexts and conceptualizations of God. Black women's preaching that concretely claims its location engages personal and communal memories and experiences at the intersection of being both Black and woman, and often neither identification as Black or woman escapes the preacher's grasp, interrupting any understanding of a binary between the identity of black and womanhood in preaching that claims such a vibrant subjectivity sophia the personification of wisdom is the black woman whose voice is perpetually repeated through the voices of other black women as black women are the voices in the preaching moment that occupy the pulpit they simultaneously invite and make room for other voices that come from with the larger community. As the preacher themselves embody a privileged space, they invite others into the space to bear witness to, make proclamation with them, broadening the meadow for all. Ingenuity, creative riffing, the unexpected twist and turns on the traditions are the way to undo interrupting the deterioration and destruction of flesh that occurs right before our very eyes and particularly that which occurs in Black worship spaces. Ingenuity is the means by which we break continuity with some of the death dealing parts of Black preaching traditions so that both the tradition and Black flesh may live into their greatest hopes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thompson. I said, uh, I shared with some colleagues earlier today, uh, we were discussing uh, the forthcoming lecture, and they asked me if I thought it would be a follow up to the uh, PBS documentary. And I said to them, I thought it would be a continuation of the conversation that the documentary started. And I think I was absolutely right in terms of well, continuation. We, there, are, there are a number of questions in the, um, in the queue that we want to get to. Uh, to, to begin with, right. you, you mentioned um, that preaching is learned through imitation and through mimicking, but earlier in the lecture, you pointed out that oftentimes in the case of black women, that either that she sounds like a woman, so I don't want to hear it, or mm -hmm. she sounds like a man. But since uh -huh. we give so much attention to this idea of black preachers or preachers, period, being able to find their voice, what does that look like? For, uh, for black women, given the fact that many of the examples of the models are men, and if she preaches like a man or mimics a man, that's a reason not to hear her. So what does that whole process yes. of finding her voice look like? Mm -hmm. um, the first thing I will say is that this is what's at the core of that big notion of pioneering and faux pioneering, right? So the idea uh, the idea that there are lack of mentors and models is a false idea. I mean, there are limited, there are limits to leadership that women have in leadership and pulpit spaces. At the same time, we have a history of black preaching women. It's a matter of raising those voices to the top. So what black women are often left to contend with is to find their own way and to think that they are the one and only and try to figure out how to come into their voice on their own. Now, here's what I will say. As I am saying that there is this broader image of black preaching and the image of the black preacher that performs in a particular way, what I am not saying is that a black woman cannot perform that way and be authentically herself. Okay. The problem 
is our stereotypes, racist and sexist stereotypes about what it means to be a woman, what it means to be a man in those very binary terms, and even what it means to perform preaching tasks. So honestly, what I'm pushing for here is to say, if we can help communities of faith come back to the core or learn how to listen for the thing we're actually listening for and encounter, and move beyond the mechanics and the embodiment of that just being the scaffolding that tells us what pre good preaching is, what we actually will get are more preaching bodies, a more diverse, a greater diversity of preaching bodies, which will expand our understanding of preaching. And when our understanding of preaching is expanded, we make room for more voices where we can listen to other folk and say yes and amen. We are. We are excited. We have just recently announced that we are getting ready to offer a D me and woman is preaching this upcoming yes. semester of Memphis Theological. So of course, that's a shameless plug for those who are listening tonight who might be interested in that, of course. So we're excited about that new track. But having said that, let me ask you this, Dr. Thompson, what role does woman is theology have in black women preachers find their voice? It has a central role. So one of the gifts of black womanist theology is the radical subjectivity and unapologetically foregrounding black women's experiences. It's not an ad hoc experience. It's not an extra experiences, but it is the lens of interpretation. So this is when I say that the black preaching tradition itself makes rooms for this and womanist theology helps interrupt that tradition in a way that expands it. This is what I mean. Uh, we always give space in black preaching traditions for the imagination to imagine ourselves into the text, out of the text, but not everyone is afforded that ability, right? And so with what womanist theology actually offers black women is to say, yeah, see yourself in the text, be in conversation with the text, own your ways of knowing and being as you engage this text. But it's not just a matter of owning, it also provides space to even sometimes push back on the text. If the goal is freedom, if the goal is liberation, then that means, gosh, there's room to do more than just uh, imitate past interpretations of a text, the past limits we place on interpreting text, and what that text means in our midst. Okay. Thank you. And I'm so glad to hear about this program. For those listening, please sign up <laughs> because these are lost voices often in the conversation as we think about womanist homiletics, as we go back to Ella Mitchell, to a Teresa Fry Brown, to a Donna Allen, to a Deb Mumford. Uh, the trajectory is there to be traced. So sign up. What, Teresa is going to be one of our adjunct <laughs> members along with, uh, oh, you along with Renita Wings and Courtney Buggs and Gina Stewart. So we're excited. <laughs> it's an opportunity to be taken. Okay. <laughs> Listen, uh, another one of the attendees asked, as we enter into this season of Lent, where we mark our foreheads, our flesh, and wrestle with dying to flesh, how might this be a time that we engage uh, the interlopers of Black flesh, more specifically, giving up the stereotypes of who should be in the pulpit, invite our churches uh, to embrace Black women preachers? In other words, it's a time for us to rest. I don't know why it isn't. If Lent brings us closer to awareness of the fragility of life, then there's no greater awareness of that than being very clear about the fragility of black flesh and the spectrum of black flesh, that black flesh that constantly with, with an awareness of that fragility. So this is a time to lean. There are different ways that we can uh, do practices of Lent or honor this idea of recognizing our fragility. And this is a time then to raise up those voices, lift up those voices, and to intentionally engage those experiences. I'm going to say something about what it looks like in practice. And this is preaching on even given day and preaching for this season. That means that when we're coming to a text, we're coming to a text with those people in mind. And we're very clear, not just with them in mind, we actually have them at the table talking to us about the text, what they experience of it, what uh, their encounters of it are, and even their own lived experience. And the litmus test for whatever we then do with that text is if our claims go out and live in the world, can these people among us that live in the most fragile states of life actually still live? 
and not unduling threat of death. <laughs> Someone else. Can it's an opportunity How do we to be the conversation <laughs> regarding the negative stereotype of African American women in the Black Church. How do we help foster positive preaching spaces for women in the church? Yes. So I'm going to be very clear. What I did in Ingenuity, even what I did tonight, was a conversation about women who chose to stay, right? <laughs> who choose to stay and do that work. There are plenty of spaces that affirm the role and presence of Black women in preaching and religious leadership. Now, everyone has to discern for themselves where they stay to fight the good fight and where they don't stay to fight the good fight. Uh, what I have learned is that over time, if you cannot thrive, your gifts cannot thrive. Uh, so part of that kind of fostering uh, the voices of Black women, even the preaching ministries of Black women, is about creating space to practice those gifts and to use those voices. Uh, so yes, if you're a person in leadership, you need to open your pulpits. Uh, and one of the undertones of tonight was this idea of even rethinking authority and preaching. The gift of authority in Black preaching traditions, the best of the traditions, is this understanding between the preacher and the community of one of, yes, I'm going to, we give you authority to go and figure out what might be a word for us today. It is call and response, though, that actually reflects a negotiation of truth and word of God in the midst, right? So if as something is called out and the listeners say amen, that's actually affirmation. And as the listeners say no, that's a wait, 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 not there. So this is what I, this is the only thing I want to hear in terms of why I say open up pulpit spaces also requires us to change our understandings of authority in preaching. The preaching moment is to start a conversation, not to dictate truth forever, right? So this is not about safeguarding the space to the ultimate end because we're so worried about so someone may do or what may happen. That concern is about power and control. The gift of the preaching moment is that it opens up an opportunity for the community to exchange ideas, exchange conversations, and kind of negotiate or discern what might be right fitting word for them today. You, when you talked about interloper, you said interlopers do not ask, but they assume their place at the table. If the, I, if the whole idea is being heard at the table, even if there is no seat at the table, does that prevent the black woman preacher from being heard at the table? Okay, yeah. So let me say something also about uh, what I said and then how it came up. I think that I admit it um, interlocker. So the okay. difference between moving from interloper to one who sits at the table is actually one who's the interlocker at I, the table, right? So I, now, and as one, then I assume my presence is to be at the table. Uh, so I want to think about that there. Uh, can you repeat the second half of your question, Dr. Question, Dr. Davis? If the, if the whole idea is not to ask for a place at the table, but to assume your place at the table. And of course, there's always conversation about a seat at the table. If the idea is to be heard and seen at the table, is a seat at the table necessary? Ah, yes. Um, and again, I'm going back to this, this uh, premise of this lecture and even uh, what this lecture was engaging in the former text of ingenuity assumes those who choose to stay uh, and can say, is a seat at the table required? Now, the history of Black women in preaching and even proclamation in Christian traditions is that many have left table. You can keep your table, right? And so there's a long standing tradition of black women's modes of proclamation taking place outside the church and pulpit spaces. And those are just as valid as anything taking place in the pulpit space. Will you, as a, as a scholar, as a practitioner, you know, as a part of the black church, what do you say to mm -hmm those black women who are listening tonight who continue to raise concerns that black women make up the majority of the participants in the black yet are continuing to engage in this debate about a place at the table mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> white supremacy becomes air right <laughs> it becomes part of the air we breathe patriarchy 
it doesn't discriminate about where or who it takes up as a host. So this is when I say that anyone can participate in the premises of exclusion Dude, and practice. I'm, I am, I'm at peace and I am Even not those going to be moved, who participate right? so to the I point of their own demise. If the okay. question is around, well, what do we do with black women blocking other black women? Well, it's the air in the context of worship, it's air in our world, and we all breathe it. And some of us try to be more aware of it than others, but it's an equal opportunity employer. <laughs> so <laughs> part of this work is not just thinking about the work that Black men must do, it's about Black relief life, period, Black people of faith, that work that everyone must do. Um, it's slow work. Change is slow. We aren't the first ones screaming for liberation and freedom. And uh, so there's this like change is slow and it is hard. And we have to recognize that sometimes folk don't want to be free. So we have to determine <laughs> when to still engage and when to move on. You mentioned earlier that uh, many have said, simply said, you know what, you can have your table. <laughs> so let me ask this. How will black women's preaching reshape the table? For those who are, who are not willing to say you can have your table, how will uh, preach, black women's preaching reshape the table altogether? It will reshape the table altogether. It will reshape the way we interpret text. It will reshape the way we think about God and faith, the claims that we make. Um, and as I said, it will reshape how we make those claims. Uh, I will, I will give an example now because I've been playing with this text and playing with some things around it, but other things. But we often think when we bring in the most minoritized voices, they're for the texts that are the most troubling, right? So the text where Bot Jephthah is being sacrificed and burned or the Levite's concubine is being brutally sexually assaulted and then cut into pieces and strewn across the land. That is not the case. If a, a recent text that has been on my mind, I've been working with, and some of you may have heard me preach around, is this, this text between Elijah and the widow of Zarephath. So it's a story where we often, you know, Elijah's going to say, give me your last. We should have some problems with that, right? <laughs> to, that says the Lord has sent, has sent him and that he will be provided for by this widow. I hear this, this sermon preached over and over again at Agnosium that she just had to trust that the provision of God would be there and trust that the man of God or the prophet of God had the word. What is interesting to me, first of all, is that we would, we know the dangers of telling people to give their last in the name of religion and faith, and then they literally have given their last and been pimped out because of that. But what is most intriguing to me is what we're willing to see or not see in a text. At the beginning of that story, it says the, the word of the Lord came to Elijah and said, I have told a woman there to feed you. And so we go on, we tell the story as it was just her faith claim. Now, I think now, why when we get to the, in the middle of the story, we don't think the woman has the revelation as well. It becomes this <laughs> one way street of Elijah has the word. And this prophet is the one to prove to this woman because it plays into the narrative of women don't know, or uh, women aren't able to be the prophet or be the proclaimer. But so what women's stories and the stories of others who are often marginalized bring to the table is an opening up of possibilities of the faith tradition. Uh, someone else uh, has asked, they said, feminist theology has often neglected the voices of people of color. How do white and non-black women preachers act as allies in making black women welcome and heard at the table? Mm. I don't know if that's the pursuit, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> I think part of the work of white folk and even white feminists is to do the anti-racist work themselves, right? As folk do work, does do, uh, folk do their work of anti-racism, it actually creates the more hospitable spaces that we're seeking. So instead of uh, just focusing on what we can do or you may do for Black women in creating those spaces. I honestly think the first step is working on one's own uh, anti-racism. Uh, as, a, as a practical matter, 
what steps can churches take to further African-American women finding their voice? What are some practical things that churches can do? Yeah, um, <clears throat> practically speaking, you can think about you know, again, I said who you would invite into pulpit spaces, but this also includes Bible study, areas of Christian education. Also, how about support women going to seminary, getting <laughs> getting theological education, uh, exposure to women, to black womanists, and to the people who are already doing the work, to homoticians who are out there, who are actually models and mentors for the work. So this is a matter of creating space and exposure. Dr. Thompson, you've been incredibly generous with your time, but we would like to ask one, one final question if we could. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> and here it is. What must preaching be and what must preaching do in this present age? Mm. Preaching must ring how true hard and clear. And how strong and when I say that, spring. preaching must ring, ring true and clear to every single person in the community, right? So if everyone can't say yes and amen, then preaching has not done its work. Now, that doesn't mean that people don't agree, but what I'm saying is if at the end of the day, we can say the work of preaching made us attend to what we feel is the core of the gospel claim <laughs> and made us accountable to that, then that's a different thing, right? So that's a different type of reading clear and true. And how it does that is attending to the fullness of life on the ground and the fullness of lived experience. And again, I always say the litmus test of this work is can that message deal death at the end of the day? I don't care if you intended it to deal death. Can it deal death at the end of the day? And if it can, then it hasn't done its job. If we claim to contend and profess a gospel of freedom and being free to life. Dr. Thompson, on behalf of our president, our dean, our student body, faculty, staff, and the friends of MTS, thank you so much. You have, in the words of my great grandmother who has now gone on to be with the Lord, you have hoped us on tonight. You have hoped us. <laughs> and for that, Thank we you, have been great great. Davis. <laughs> you have hoped us. You have challenged us and given us much to much to think about. Given us much to think thank about. You so. so again, thank, thank you. you. Again, to all of our participants, thank you so much for logging on tonight. I know without question, you have been blessed, you have been encouraged, and certainly have been inspired to the point where I know you are going to immediately go to our website and get the information on our new D-Men and Woman is Preaching because listen, you wanna learn more and you wanna do more and we've got the program just for you. So again, Dr. Thompson, thank you so much for sharing with us and to all of our participants. Good night and God bless. <laughs>